So we are very close to the Passover season. Um, I think 10 days from now, uh, a week from this coming Wednesday is Passover. And uh, John asked me if I'd share something with regards to Passover and told him what I was thinking about. And he thought that would be kind of uh, fun. So if we go to John chapter 12, this, a, a couple things have, had taken place uh, in my life. And recently I had to attend two funerals or I attended two funerals of, of two relatively young people who had passed away pretty much in the prime of their lives. And um, it was, it, it just, it really stirred me um, going to them and my own mortality was staring at me when I attended those two particular funerals. Uh, I, I thought about, you know, I'm not getting any younger, you know, and if the Lord tarries, um, I'll probably also pass away. And that was, it was just a really honest thought pattern or, or time to reflect and consider and think. And as I did, I thought, well, I wonder what Jesus must have thought, you know, uh, especially going into this time period, the Passover. What was he working with in his mind? What did he think, um, knowing what was ahead? And um, I, I think this will be fun to look at. In John, John chapter 12, verse 1, uh, I've got to scroll up here. Yeah, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus raised out from among the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those who was reclining to eat with him. Um, the picture, you, I, I think you all know, but I'll share it anyways. When they ate in the East, they didn't eat at tables like we do. They didn't have tables and chairs. They're very few things in their homes. They would recline, spread a large uh, cloth on the floor. They would recline on pillows on the floor and then the food would be brought out and laid in the center of that uh, rug or that, that cloth. Um, and it would be more community type eating. You would have bread, dip it in this and, and start eating together and you're sharing that way and everyone's reclining and relaxing and conversing. And that's the picture here. They're all in, and also this um, incident, this dinner and this gathering takes place in Simon the leper's house. You can see that by comparing uh, the same account in Matthew and in Luke, uh, and I believe also in Mark, but. Uh, you can see that, that they are in Simon the leper's house, and, Mar and uh, uh, Mar Martha is serving uh, the Lord and, and the guests there and the people, and, and of course, Simon too. Um, so they're reclining to eat with him, with Jesus. And then Mary, having taken three quarters of a pound, three quarters of a pound, and that's a Roman pound. A Roman pound is uh, 12 ounces, where our imperial pound or our pound is uh, 16 ounces. Uh, this is a three quarters of a pound, so nine ounces in weight. Uh, she takes about three quarters of a pound of expensive perfume made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. But Judas Iscariot, Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one about to betray him, says, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Uh, now, he said this not because he was really concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having the money box, he used to pilfer from it. He used to steal from it, uh, from what was put in it. Therefore, Jesus said, leave her alone. She has kept this until now for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have with me. I thought when I read this, 
you know, Jesus is very aware of what's coming up because he, he says it right there. This was prepared for, or this was um, kept for my burial for, for now, for this period of time. And to get an idea of really how much that, that um, perfume was worth, it, it's a year's wages. Probably in today's money, somewhere between forty and sixty thousand dollars worth of perfume that she anoints Jesus with, and if you read the other records that um, you know talk about the same incident here, it's not just his feet, but she pours it on his on his head also, and Jesus even says um, she has anointed my entire body or my body, so she's she putting this lavish perfume all over him and it, the fragrance fills the house. And um, uh, so and it's, this incident is taking place in Bethany. Now, if we go down a little bit farther, the reason why, there's a reason why I started here, but go down to verse 12. So they're in, they're in Simon the leper's house. They probably stayed there that night or Jesus did rather. Maybe not all the guests, but Jesus did. And on the next day, and his disciples, um, verse 12, on the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, uh, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And Jesus, having found a young donkey, sat on it. Just as it was written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king comes sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified later on, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, and raised him up from among the dead was testifying. For this reason, the crowd went with, went and met him because they heard that he had done this sign. Um, and the record goes on. So the next day, G first of all, Jesus travels to Bethany. He had traveled from Jericho to Bethany. He spends the day in Be or the afternoon in Bethany and a dinner. Spends the night there gets up the next morning, and they start walking to uh, Jerusalem. And this uh, record, you know, it's traditionally called the, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem because Jesus is going in as the king um, in victory. And I'm going to share my screen. I want to share a picture with you. If uh, I gotta bring it all up. Here we go. I think you can see that. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. So here's Bethany, way over here. I know you can see a whole lot of other stuff on my screen. I apologize for that, but here's Bethany, and the, the next morning, they start traveling. It's about three miles straight to Jerusalem, but they go up. Here's the Mount of Olives, right? Jesus knows what's coming. He knows that, you know, his final hour is approaching, and he walks from Bethany that next day. They come up and they're at here, they get to the crest or the top of the Mount of Olives. And as they, you know, when you're at the top of the Mount of Olives, you can see almost all of Jerusalem from up there. You certainly can see the temple facing east. So Jesus and his disciples are on, the, on they at some point crest the Mount of Olives and what they see before them is this Kidron Valley it goes down and comes back up to uh, to Jerusalem to the temple and then on to Jerusalem uh, to the west of the temple. And this is a really steep valley. 
uh, this walk traditionally uh, by many, um, you know, Christians call this walk from Bethany to Jerusalem, the Palm Sunday walk. Actually, it takes place on a uh, Friday, it takes place five days before Passover, because Jesus is at Bethany six days before Passover, right? So Passover is on a Wednesday, six days prior. That was on a Thursday. So this walk now takes place on Friday. So if we're going to name it something, maybe call it uh, Palm Friday walk. <laughs> but they get to the top of the Mount of Olives and they look down and this whole Kidron Valley right here. Um, and in the next couple of days, Jesus is going to cross this Kidron Valley four times. This, for, this one right now, when he walks from Bethany to uh, Jerusalem, that's one time. Um, and then we're going to, re you know, we'll read again where they cross it again. And so anyways, they get to Jerusalem and you know that uh, um, he sends two of his disciples ahead to find the guy with the jug of water. They go into the house with him, starts preparing you know, to prepare a place for the, for the Last Supper. John taught about that, I think, last Sunday, about that prayer uh, in John 17 that takes place at the end of the Last Supper, the supper that he has with his disciples. Um, and then after that, let me hold on here. We've got to go to uh, John 18. So after that Last Supper, when, uh, in John 18, after the prayer in John 17, John 18, 1, when Jesus had spoken these words at the end of, of the prayer and and the words that he closed with, he went out with his disciples across the ravine of the brook Kidron to where there was a garden, which he himself and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who was about to betray, or who was betraying him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Jesus then, having received the Roman cohort and also the temple police from the chief priests, and the Pharisees went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. They go to arrest Jesus. But Jesus crosses this Kidron Valley again, a second time. And he's going to cross it two more times. And I thought, what was going, what was Jesus thinking um, when he crossed this Kidron Valley, when he went through the Kidron Valley? And what came to my mind and my heart was Psalm 23. Yahweh is my shepherd, I will not lack. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and covenant faithfulness will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in Yahweh's house for the length for my length of days. We, you know, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, you know, it, it says in Scripture that he was very troubled within himself, and it, this was a very difficult time for him. Also said that in John, we didn't read the verse, but it said he was very troubled within himself. Um, and that word troubled means not only to be agitated, but also knowing that there's, there's bad things ahead. It's a, a feeling of dread that troubled within his spirit, troubled within himself. 
he gets to the top of, Mount, of the Mount of Olives and he sees this valley that he's going to cross, the Kidron Valley. Right? Off to the left and around the bend is also uh, the Valley of Gehenna, you know, where the trash is burning. You can smell it. He goes to Jerusalem, has the Last Supper, goes back to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, crosses the Kidron Valley again, knowing what's coming up during the Passover. You know, what was he thinking about? What did he do to settle his heart and his mind being troubled within himself? I think Psalm 23 could have been one of those things. It certainly helped me um, when I was there at those two funerals and, and you know, I considered my own mortality and I thought about that. You know, what did Jesus think? Did he think about Psalm 23? Uh, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort him, comfort me. And so Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, the, the uh, priests and the Roman guards and police, um, come and arrest him and they take him now uh, under arrest back across the Kidron Valley so the third time but this time he's in the hands of the enemy and of course then we know that you know what transpires that after that he goes through the trial and is beaten he's beaten beyond my mind's comprehension And then they lead him one more time across the valley of the shadow of death to the Mount of Olives to be crucified. Now, he goes the one fourth fourth time to back up to the Mount of Olives and is crucified. I just thought about that so much about what is it like when we are staring at something What should we consider um, when it looks like we are staring at the valley of the shadow of death, whatever that situation may be in our lives? Psalm 23 is one thing to consider and think about. Another is, what did Jesus do and what did Jesus think? He finally said in the Garden of Gethsemane, after praying and, and, you know, you can see it in the scripture where it's just a very stressful moment for him. He said, but not my will, but your will be done, Father. The other thing that I thought about during that, those two situations, those two funerals was, what promise has God given me? What, what do I know for sure that God will raise my body up? Yes, I know I can speak in tongues, and and I know that God does not lie, and I know what scripture says, but is there something, what has he said that I can latch on to, that I really, really know that he will put my body back together, that he will raise me up, and I thought of this, Ezekiel chapter 37, if you want to go there, this is so beautiful. It's very graphic, but in this context, it's very gorgeous, very beautiful. And Jesus knew what this was. I mean, he had probably read it a million times. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of Yahweh was, was on me, and he brought me out, of the, out by the spirit of Yahweh and set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them all around and behold there were there were very many on the surface of the valley and behold they were very dry he said to me son of man can these bones live and i answered "O oh lord yahweh you know then he said to me prophesy over these bones and tell them O oh, dry bones hear the word of yahweh this is what the lord yahweh says to these bones behold i will cause my spirit to enter into you and you will live I will put sinews on you and will bring up flesh on you and cover you with skin. And I will put spirit in you and you will live 
and you will know that I'm Yahweh. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there, was, there were sinews on them, and flesh grew upon them, and skin covered them over, but there was no spirit in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the spirit, prophesy, son of man, and tell the spirit, this is what the Lord Yahweh says. Come from the four winds, O spirit, and breathe on these slain, so that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the spirit came into them, and they came to life, and they stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. And he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, and are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy, and, uh, prophesy and tell them this is what the Lord Yahweh says. Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. Oh, my people, I will bring you into the land of Israel. And Jesus had, re had read that many times. And I'm sure that brought comfort to him as, as Psalm 23 did too. And the Lord finally says, not my will, but your will, Father. And, you know, when we face rough times, we have to have something that we latch on to that we uh, that brings us comfort so that we can stand so that we can continue to say no nope, not my will father yours psalm 23 though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for thou art with me i know that yahweh will put my bones back together put my body back together build sinew and flesh and breathe life into me once again should i perish in this life and during this passover season you know we consider jesus and his sacrifice and what he did for us and also we consider the the rejoicing the the wonderful event of resurrection that God brought Jesus Christ up from out from among the dead, and he will do the same for you and I too. So that's kind of what I was thinking about leading into this Passover season. So bless you guys. <laughs>